I'm the dean of the Milano School and the graduate program in international affairs. And I'm delighted to welcome you here on this uh, special afternoon. Uh, I was uh, involved for many years indirectly in a center for development economics. And I remember with a certain measure of poignancy my colleagues uh, who taught development economics returning from a year or a year and a half in a developing country. And after five minutes of conversation, they were close to tears because they had been so ineffective. It was so hard to do development when they were working on national development. And they had tried, I, I knew these people for 25 years. Year after year, they'd come back with the same stories. They didn't understand development. They didn't understand how to manage it. And I don't know whether uh, development in the, in the urban setting is easier. I doubt it. I doubt if it's easier. But it's, in a sense, manageable, especially if it's done in a neighborhood and expanding rather than attempting to teach farmers how to manage their crops when they didn't know anything about traditional methods of farming and didn't realize that after a 1,000 years, people had actually solved some problems that they knew nothing about. And I don't think that uh, happens now. And I think uh, development has, has uh, enhanced its capacity to make a difference. We're still making inadvertent errors. There was a recent article on quinoa in the Andes. And the fact that uh, the price of this very special beet-like grain, it's not a grain. It's, I think, related to beets. Enormously nutritious. It, the price of it has gone up so high that everything is getting sold. And the capacity of the people in the country who depend on this has been undercut because their quinoa is gone, sold to the rest of the world. This is the kind of problem that development has to cope with, uh, that uh, inadvertent or unexpected outcomes make such an enormous difference, negatively or positively. And we're very fortunate uh, this afternoon to have two people who know what they're talking about, who have been successful in what they do, prize winners on occasion. And we're very fortunate to have an opportunity to hear from them, to hear about uh, urban development in the South. Uh, my experience in, in Latin America, to the extent I've had it, in Africa more so, is the problems are pretty hard. So we need a lot of talent to be able to manage it, and we're fortunate enough to have extraordinary talent with us this evening. So I will turn it over to Mike Cohen, who is uh, the director of the Graduate Program in International Affairs, uh, to introduce our colleagues and to moderate a conversation. Welcome again. Thanks very much, Neil. Tonight really is a special occasion, and I really want to uh, thank uh, Sheila and Abba for, for joining us here. And I'd like to thank Bob Buckley and, and Sky Dobson for helping get it, to get it all organized. Um, I know these people for quite a while, Sheila for much longer. <laughs> Somehow we're, we're younger now, right? We're, but we, um, both, of, both, both Sheila and Abba, uh, play very important roles in the in sort of the world of the international world of the city of how the city is understood how people think about policy how think people think about change about improvement and not only do they do they play important roles and and do them very well and are very well known for what they do but they're also very important because they they come from the same part of the world, they, yet they occupy very different roles. And I would argue that the roles, in fact, are in an interesting way, are sort of in tension with one another. And the question of, of what it means and, and, and how they can have a conversation and talk about what they do is also extremely interesting. Um, 
I can say to both of them that uh, when I first came to the new school, the first time I had to give a talk was in this room. And I walked into this room and looked around and said, well, I was coming from the World Bank, and this was a little different. <laughs> and the images were a little different, and it was a little startling. Um, and uh, the ambiance is different, but I think the, the, the fact that in this space, with these powerful images from by a Mexican muralist, uh, we can think about the, the kind of serious issues of, of poverty and poverty reduction and, and how the city is a critical space in which these things go on. It's an appropriate place to talk about serious things. Uh, this evening, um, we're going to have a uh, talk and conversation between, between Sheila Patel and Abu Joshi Ghani. Uh, Sheila uh, is the founder of Spark, which is an organization in Mumbai which was focused on area redevelopment for many years and has, has grown over this period on the basis of its accomplishments now to They've created the Slum Dwellers International, which is an important organization with uh, activities in many countries and many parts of India. It's a real example of scaling up in the best sense of how we understand scaling up. Um, and Sheila will speak first. Uh, delighted to have learned recently that she just won a major presidential prize in India for her outstanding work, which is really an extraordinary honor. And so we're, congratulations. It's it's great to hear that. And Abhijoshi Ghani is the chief of the urban development unit in, in, in the bank. I don't know what they call it, unit or division now? It's unit, still unit. unit. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, has recently uh, led a process in the World Bank to come up with a new urban development strategy and to think about how the bank and the international community can, can interact more constructively and positively around urban issues. So we're very interested that, to hear you talk about what you're doing and how you see these issues now. Um, I'm inviting uh, Sheila to speak first because uh, we're going to be putting something on, on the screen in a little while as soon as we get the computer set up. Um, so I'd like to welcome you. And please, uh, why don't you I'm start? Do you want to talk? Well, why don't you start off for maybe about a half hour or so, or 20 minutes, perhaps? Thanks, Mike. <clears throat> uh, I've come many times on your invitation to speak here, but never to this room. And I think uh, for those of us who work on issues of poverty, there are many inspirational aspects of this room that we take a lot of inspiration you know, a lot of ideas, a lot of strategies from. Uh, what I'd like to do in my conversation with you today is to share with you a, a story that when I set up Spark, I had no idea that I would be part of. And to say that to you in the hope that it'll inspire you to go after your dream we are all people who are going to go into hopefully different forms of development. So the first thing to do is to share with you the story of Spark and STI. And then to go to the more serious issue of looking at urbanization and its challenges and to look at ways by which those of us who are local and those of us who are global uh, can actually use the spaces that we have today to work together. It was definitely not something that we could do when I started work many years ago. And then I'd like to work out that we have some time in which we can have question and answers, because I think I enjoy that more than making presentations. So I hope we have that time. So to quickly walk you through my, my personal and my organizational story is that I started doing work in cities in 1974, so you can date me. I finished university, went and started this work and worked for 10 years 
in a welfare organization before, my colleague Celine, who's sitting at the back, and myself, and many others, found its spark. And what we found out was that in 19, between 1974 and mid-1980s, it was politically incorrect to be a good activist and be working in urban areas because the action was all in rural areas, because there was a deep belief that if you sorted everything out in rural areas, you found people jobs, you got them access to voice and choice, that they wouldn't come to urban areas. And if you look at development practice, and you look at development theory building, and you look at investments that most of our governments in the South and development agencies that supported them in the North did, it was based on this very important perspective. And so going against that perspective, many of us realized that even in 1970s, we in Mumbai were facing huge waves of migrants coming into the city. They were coming into the city because of a breakdown of livelihoods, of being evicted due to religious and caste prosecution, and simply because they wanted a better quality of life for their children. And what we found is that all these people <coughs> came to the city without any asset, they came without any skills, and they squatted wherever they could. And what we were watching, because we had become people working in that process, something that was happening historically over a period of time, only that the waves of people coming into the cities were gradually and exponentially growing. And what we found was that the city actually didn't know what to do with all these people coming in. It didn't have a place for them to stay. And it was extremely hostile to the fact that they were squatting everywhere. And so in a strange sense, the nation state and its local representation that was the city, instead of addressing the issue of the vulnerability of the recent migrant that was helped plusly pushed into the city and helping them in whichever way they could, the city systematically conducted demolitions of their fragile houses every 15 days to a month. And those of us who were working in welfare found that despite our being very efficient in sending their kids to school and organizing their health and getting them jobs and teaching them how good nutrition was and dealing about women's emancipation, every month their asset base was depleted. Uh, they were beaten up. The men who fought were taken to jail. <coughs> and it was the classical leaking bucket of impoverishment that we all talk about in development. So some of us who were very young at that time got very pissed off, went to court. To, you know, that time we had a very enlightened Supreme Court Chief Justice who said that even a letter uh, addressing helplessness and fear would be treated as a public interest litigation. So we were all gung-ho, you know, the court is with us. We went to court, and I found within a week of doing that, that my trustees were very angry with me. They said, we cannot afford for the municipality to be angry with us because we get our grants from them. So please withdraw your public interest litigation. And if you want to make that, do it in your personal capacity, not on the basis of this organization. So those of us who were really angry with it said, why should we work for an organization that's happy to take money in the name of poor people, but is not ready to defend their rights? So we left, and we set up Spark in 1984. And our 
our goal at that time in 1984 was to be an organization that was not risk averse, but risk embracing. He said, let's look of all the things that we need to do in order to be useful and to make a contribution to what poor people needed to happen. And we set for ourselves three very strong <coughs> commitments. We said we would work, we would start our work with the poorest and the most vulnerable in the city. We said we'd do that because we know that development never trickles down. And so if you pick up the low-hanging fruit and do smart things that give you results quickly, you know that those processes would never reach the poorest. So we start with the bottom and we hope that things will percolate upwards. The second thing that we said we would do is we would continue to find solutions for the bottom 30% of any constituency that we would work with. And we wouldn't care how long it took us to get that solution for the same reason. And the third thing we said is that we really believe that in cities, poor women are the managers of survival infrastructure. That means when you go to very, poor very, very poor neighborhoods that are very vulnerable, it's the women who work out the logistics of survival. And yet, when any development actor comes into that process, suddenly two men appear. <laughs> and they are the representatives. And the women abdicate that space. And they abdicate that space for many reasons, but they always abdicate that space. So we said, can we work out a way by which we would explore the possibility of creating space for women's collectives to retain their leadership in grassroots communities and help them negotiate their relationship with men so that men and women in poor areas work together. Now, this was the 1980s, and all our feminist friends were very angry with us because it was that time the the dominant way in which feminists operated, that it was men against women. And what the poor women in these neighborhoods taught us was that if poor women in families did not have the safety net of their family and communities, they were even more vulnerable. And that it was more important to renegotiate their roles and functions with these institutions rather than seek to abandon them. So as middle class, professional women, this was very hard to swallow. But if we wanted to work with poor women, we had to accommodate this reality. And I'm saying this to you because many times uh, when we develop an intellectual position, we get really angry when, when poor women or neighborhood groups tell you what you're saying is wrong. But you need to re-explore that position from the point of view of the practical process and reality through which poor people and poor women live in. Because it gives you a reality check of how you move from the position where they are to the transformation of their role, relationship, and status. And this is true of any vulnerable group. Anyway, so. We did that. So we started working with pavement dwellers. And to cut a long story short, before we could tell them, what would you like us to do with us, poor women caught up with us and says, we know how to send our kids to school. We know how to go to the hospital. Our real problem is we, our houses get demolished all the time. So you work with us on this. And between 1986 and 88, we found out that the pavement dwellers living in Mumbai, who are around 30,000 households, were even despised by the slum dwellers, who felt that these were really stupid people. Why were they going and squatting on the pavements? They should have squatted on open land, because 
The politics of those lands are different from the pavement lands. Anyway, while we were looking at all those things, a amazing organization of men who were defending their slums called the National Slum Dwellers Federation came to look at what we were doing and said, we'd like an alliance with you. And so out of that process came an alliance of SPARC, that's us middle class professional people, mainly women. Mahila Milan, which is the network of these women's collectors we were working with, and the National Slum Dwellers Federation. And what we negotiated with the National Slum Dwellers Federation is that they would treat Mahila Milan as a sister organization, and they would make a commitment to include and ensure that in their leadership process, more and more women participated. <coughs> and to give credit to them, about more than 50% leadership of NSTF today are women. So what NSTF taught us was that, I still remember, and any of you are planners. How many of you are planners here or have aspirations to be planners? Okay, not many, two, three. <coughs> but I love to say this to planners. He basically taught us that the problem with planners is that they think the business of planning is a technical and a managerial process. He says planning is deeply political. And the problem with planners is that the government trains them to become managers. And before you know it, 30 to 50% of the people living in the city get excluded from planning processes. Anyway, so our journey continued in which through the NSTF, we began to acknowledge that the issue of slums, the issue of planning, the issue of who has land is a deeply political process and that we as professionals and our um, crazy dreams that we would impact policy were not very good, they were not very smart. And so we transformed ourselves into being organization that backstopped NSTF and Mahila Milan, who federated communities that had similar land problems, trained them to do surveys, to collect census-like data about themselves, to produce savings collectives of women that managed to produce sustainable processes in neighborhoods. And that created a community, a national community that had solidarity and understanding of the politics of this process. So that over a period of 10 years, suddenly we were an alliance that was present in 70 cities in nine states of India and had over 700,000 families as members. So we became a process that was difficult to politically ignore because we weren't part of any political process. And through this, we began to negotiate with municipalities, with national governments and with states on issues of land, on housing, on infrastructure, and challenging the way in which this was being designed and executed. In 1981, in 1991, we got invited to South Africa to meet people from township before Nelson Mandela and his government came in to look at how would these townships that were created out of apartheid could be part of the, the mainstream government's plans of housing. And in that came an amazing relationship between India and South African federations that led to the formation of the Shack Dwellers International. It came out of the deep angst that poor communities and their leadership felt when NGO representatives like me or Celine were their mouthpieces when any international representation came. And they said, we want to do that. And so you have an STI an organization 
that uh, seeks to reproduce the federation model in which citywide federations seek to produce data about themselves and negotiate with the municipality and the national governments about how they would like to participate in the design and execution of investments to transform informal settlements. And in doing that, we found that in many of our countries, there were World Bank projects, there were UN projects, there were bilateral agencies that had projects. And out of a necessity to interact with them, we began to understand the politics of these institutions and began to represent to them the local reality that made many of the things that they were doing dysfunctional and trying to change that. So today we have a situation in which STI operates in 33 countries. You have colleagues who've come to India, to Uganda, and to, I hope many of you visit some of the other countries. Mike, you have to plan that to expand it to more. We are in many more countries now. And the goal of this process is to get our national governments and our municipalities to acknowledge a very important reality that in an urbanizing world, slums are there for the next 30 to 50 years until the urban population stabilizes. The poor people with no assets are going to come into cities they're going to come there. It's not going to be easy for the city and the state to produce housing for them at the rate at which they're going to come and make it financially viable. That an increasing amount of the city is going to be informal. That the global economic order forces more and more informalization of livelihoods. And that's going to produce new challenges for cities. And the third very important thing is that an increasing number of people living in slums are going to be less than 35 years old. So it's going to change the politics of how these people are going to react. And I think that what we see in the last two or three months of what's happening in the Arab world, you get an understanding that Country politics can be transformed by the angst of city dwellers in ways that we have never imagined. And we already see a very big difference between migrants who came 30 years ago and migrants who come today. And they're like, the, they're li like all young, impatient people. They're not going to be thankful for being allowed to come into the city. They, they will demand and expect inclusion. They will demand and expect the right to their aspirations. And somewhere, development investment and development theory of asking poor people to be patient is going to, make, is going to be made to stand on its head. And so a lot of what all of us have to do in, if you're part of the development process is to understand that there's a new language to understand urban development and the impatience of large volumes of people to seek a good quality of life is not going to make development happen over five or 10 decades. If it doesn't happen soon, it's going to create crisis. So thank you. Thanks very much, Sheila. I think it's very important for everybody to kind of understand how, how ideas and positions and things evolve over time, you know, and these issues which seem very absolute, the, the slum problem or so, is really the perception of the slum problem, the perception of what one could do about it changes, the perception of personal roles change. And this comment about, your, your last comment about the, the impatience of younger people, uh, of course, we don't have that here, but, uh, so, <laughs> but it's, of course, it's it's absolutely appropriate, and I think it reflects the the, the speeding up of all kinds of things that are going on. So now I'd like to invite Abba to to speak, and I, I are you able to set up the computer now with the great? 
Okay, so. I'm going to talk a bit first and then we'll go on that. Yeah? So firstly, um, thank you very much, Mike and Bob, for inviting me here on this wonderful occasion. I do want to say that um, under Mike Cohen and Bob Buckley, we call what we, um, that the, what we say is that the World Bank had its golden age in urban, because I think that's the time then that um, some fantastic new thinking came out on urban issues and some excellent research and, and good work was done. So since then, um, the urban department in some ways has been trying to play um, catch up and, and it's, it's very, very difficult, but um, it's, it's good to be here. And uh, it's uh, such a pleasure to be um, here with Sheila, someone that I have worked with and um, that I admire immensely for the sort of um, voice she has brought and, and, and the kind of impact that she's had in terms of um, the voice of, um, of the poor um, in cities and the sort of inclusiveness that she has um, um, you know, um, fought to bring about. Um, I wanted to, to say um, a few things about, you know, Sheila started with, so here we are working locally and we are working globally. And so you heard from a very, very grassroots organization of what's happening in the, in the urban space and spe specifically on, on the urban poor. Um, how do you give them voice and how do you demand, demand accountability and does development trickle down or not? So I'm going to come a little bit um, from a global developmental aspect. And um, I think in, in, in the World Bank's thinking itself, and I would say in, in, in development thinking itself, you know, for, for some time, um, the whole concept of urbanization and so on was sort of lying uh, dormant. We were not focusing on it, and we were more into sort of um, um, rural development, and, you know, um, cities were really seen actually by most national policy makers, and that's why we found it difficult to engage a bit, as, you know, places of, of crime and grime and congestion, and that urbanization was better um, if it was contained rather than something which was managed for, for the uh, betterment of all. But we've seen a change in that thinking, and, and we do believe that there is actually a paradigm shift. And the reason that that has happened really is because, as all of us know, some, some stylized facts, that the world today is half urban, that most of the urban growth um, in the next 20 years is going to take place in some of the poorest countries in the world, which are in Africa and Asia. We also know today that um, cities are agglomeration economies and they do lead uh, growth in countries and that no country has reached middle income status without urbanizing. So given all that, so if you're looking at growth and we are looking at poverty reduction, then how is it that we cannot be engaged in urban space? And um, what was also interesting for us as, as a development institution is how difficult it has been to put urban issues in a national discourse. When we talk at the national level on policy, policy for growth, policy for poverty alleviation, um, we found that urban was distinctly missing because, and, and, and this is very much, a, um, I think, a problem of, you know, are cities empowered? Are local governments empowered? And if they're not empowered, then they're not a part of national policy and national discourse. So about two years ago, we did um, a new World Bank urban strategy that Mike actually referred to. And we felt that we needed to look at urbanization in a different way, and that's where we call a paradigm shift. And that we needed to see urban in sort of very, very distinct lines of the rural urban transformation. So not looking at urban as static, but actually something which is happening. And to also kind of bust this false dichotomy of what is rural is not urban and what is urban is not rural, because we see a clear link. Secondly, we wanted to really focus on, um, on inclusive um, and equitable development. And once we talk about <clears throat> that, we need to look at, you know, um, do cities make people poor or do cities attract poor people? Because that is one way that the poor can find a way to actually better themselves socially and economically. That's where the services are. The third aspect was really looking at 
we are talking about sustainability, we are talking about climate change, we are saying um, that um, I think it was the Mayor of London, um, Ken Livingston, who said that the battle for climate change will be one of fought in cities. And why is that? Because 80% of the GAG emissions come from cities because 40% um, of the energy is consumed in cities. And as cities in developing countries grow, and as the consumption power grows up, they will be consuming more and more resources. So if we do not look at compact growth and sustainable growth, then you know, we will not really be um, addressing that um, at all. And then fourthly, governance. And in terms of governance, we are really looking at not only decentralization and empowering local governments and giving them the voice and demanding accountability on from, from the top, but we are also looking at our cities managed well at all. And, and they are not, because that's where there's the least amount of capacity. Mm -hmm. Municipal workers are not professional workers. You know, in, in my country, and, and Sheila would agree to that, if you can't find a job anywhere else, you go and work for the municipality. And in terms of empowerment, what do municipalities do? The two main functions are waste picking and dog catching. So, you know, how do we get management and good management um, into cities? So, and so we kind of recast a little bit the urban urban debate. And you know, every time I look on my right and I see uh, Gandhiji's um, fresco there, I also remember that it was Gandhi who said that the heart of India dwells in its villages. And it has taken us a long time to move to, from, from that to say, actually, you know, India really dwells in its cities and that's where the problems are and that's where we need to, uh, to resolve things. Um, so in terms of rethinking the approach to urban, um, you know, our first area was, you know, how do we then bring urbanization and those issues at the national discourse um, so that we impact policies at the na national level. We should be able to engage ministries of finance into that debate and not just ministries of, you know, um, local governments and, 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 and towns because that's not where the real power lies. Um, secondly, in terms of our own working, to have an impact, can we move from retailing to wholesaling of our um, investments? So instead of doing city by city, you know, investment in drains and investment in solid waste and, and helping them to plan, can we actually look at systems of cities? And can we invest in systems of governance, of systems of sustainability, systems for, you know, equity and, and inclusion? Um, and also, given the fact that, you know, we, that the major growth is actually happening in secondary and small cities. It's not the big metropolitan cities which are growing. So we do need to focus ourselves on how do we have the biggest bang for our, for our buck. And fourthly, you know, we need to actually work at the city level. So um, the city level discourse was also very, very important. Um, but today what I want to talk about, as if I haven't talked enough already, <laughs> is um, a new um, a knowledge platform on urbanization that we have just started working on. And it's really, it came from the fact that, you know, there's so much actually happening on urban issues worldwide. And it's happening at the level of grassroots organizations like Slum Dwellers International and Spark, and, you know, the, the, the waste, um, Pickers International and the, and the Home Workers International, those are grassroots organizations, but also in, in think tanks um, and in universities like here um, and in the developing countries. And then policymakers are talking and cities are getting together in little networks of their own and thinking about what are the solutions. So we, we know that the city of Dhaka today is talking to the city of New Orleans on, on how do we do flood management? What did you learn from Katrina? And, um, and, you know, the, the city of um, Kabul may be actually advising Khartoum on, on how do we come out of conflict and, and civil war. So we know that cities are talking to each other. They are networking based on some very, very specific alliances. Coastal cities in Africa want to know what the coastal cities in Asia are doing <coughs> about rising flood levels and, and how do we adapt and how do we mitigate. So bringing all these wonderful discourses, can we do that globally and can we actually put all these networks 
together. So that's something that um, the bank has just launched, it's sort of end of January, um, and that's something that we are taking around the world to see if we can create a real network of policy makers, of, of, um, of mayors, of city administrators, of NGOs, of CBOs, um, of uh, brokers such as the World Bank or Brookings Institution or Asian Development Bank, um, and bring us all together on, on a global urban discourse so that we all connect on knowledge, we all collect, connect on good and best practice. And let's see if we can sustain this momentum and actually um, <clears throat> get some real, um, um, either identify knowledge gaps and further research, or actually get people together so that they exchange ideas and learn. And I know when I explain this to you, it's, it's almost like eating mist. That's what someone told me. So we actually have a presentation here which will give it a bit more structure for you. And I'd like to invite uh, my colleague, Austin Kilroy, to actually make that um, presentation. So thanks, Austin. Okay, so um, we're gonna show a short video which is about four or five minutes long. Um, <coughs> essentially, you can look You'll, you'll get a few people explaining um, why urbanization is important. So this kind of sets the, the, the agenda. Um, and then we'll give a, a quick overview of the kind of thing that we are planning with the knowledge platform. These, at, at this stage, these are more ideas than concrete plans. So especially um, in a seat of learning as well, it would be excellent to hear how people think that knowledge transfer occurs. So how, how you feel that you learn best. On, on urban issues or on, on uh, the kind of things that, that crop up in the, in the video. Urbanization is the defining phenomenon of the 21st century. Nearly two billion people are expected to move to cities and towns over the next 20 years. Rural to urban transition is a once in a lifetime event we cannot afford to get it wrong. Urbanization and economic growth go hand in hand. Looking at Japan, we can see that economic activity is densely packed in Tokyo. In the US, cities are also the engines of growth. But this is not just a developed country phenomenon. Economic activity in developing countries is also highly concentrated in cities across all regions of the world. Urbanization presents great opportunities for economic growth and poverty reduction. But it also carries great potential costs, particularly for urban poverty and the environment. Cities drained on energy, cities drowning in solid waste. I used to work on Cairo, so incredible asthma rates amongst children under five. Is a country of immigration. In Dakar used to live on tourism and fishing, but this resource is drying up. The urbanization knowledge platform will connect and convene national policymakers, cities, researchers, private sector, and civil society. It'll draw on the best available knowledge and experience, and it will help translate ideas into action. For the first time in history, more than half the world's population will reside in cities. The first way in which we want to help address these challenges is by connecting city practitioners to one another. The nature of the problems are so complex that no one agency can deal with it. And what we realized is the individual silos of energy, public sector services, real estate, and transportation, but they're not talking to each other. And we believe fundamentally the network as a platform, almost like the fourth essential utility in city building, is what's going to get cities to the next level. And so we're really thinking hard about how can we come up with new creative ideas where the poor can still keep that seat at the table? Fundamental truth is that cities don't make people poor, not usually. Cities attract poor people. Now when they're functioning well, they're, they're attracting poor people by being avenues of opportunity. 
we had a very uh, successful slum upgradation program uh, with the municipal corporation. Slum networking project is nothing but networking the city infrastructure to slums. This isn't something that you do once and then say, well, we've got this ready, we're a smart city and so forth, that in fact uh, every city has to continually reinvent itself. The bank today is no longer only a generator of knowledge. It has to be a catalyst for knowledge. It has to bring the knowledge from all other parts. Reinvention of cities. Cities are, you know, it, it's a living a living thing and uh, and reinvention is an integral part of uh, the city's, of any city's life cycle. We really got to start thinking about these economic models not in terms of the trade-offs, you know, within the immediate future and bringing in business, etc. We have to look at what is the sustainable issue in terms of maintaining that economy. Green collar economies, green collar jobs, that kind of financing, especially with institutions like the World Bank, the Asian Development Bank, or the UN, can really start to stimulate cities to divert their traditional economic growth models into a more ecologically sound one. We obviously meet at a critical moment for our cities and our world, a moment when the challenges our cities face are only matched by the opportunities that they offer. We as economists, we think about how things are done and what things are done. And we don't think that much about where things are done. It can be the difference between poverty and prosperity. Cities are places where problems and solutions meet and where also a demographic and economic transformation is taking place. And if we don't seize the moment now, then we would really have lost the development agenda. So um, if that seemed a little bit like a sales pitch, that's because it was. Um, we, we made this uh, video to apply for funding just to get this started. Um, I'm just going to take a, maybe two or three minutes just to ad lib a little bit on, on what the platform does. I don't think it's the right time to go all the way through the presentation. Um, the, the first thing um, that I wanted to say, just to draw some continuity with um, the, 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 the fascinating story that Sheila uh, Patel presented. On slums in particular, I think it's important to point out there are, there are at least two, two uh, not sides of the story, but two strands going on here. One is the political economy of slums. And that, that is um, exactly what organizations like STI uh, do extremely well. The other strand here is the technical um, reasons, the underlying causes for why slums come about. And that is probably more uh, the direction that the urbanization knowledge platform is veering in, including some of the, 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 the process questions about how to overcome uh, slums in practice. But on, on the technical suite of underlying causes, what do I mean? Well, for example, we are just in, this, in the stages of finishing uh, a, uh, an analytical study on slums in India called the Urbanization Review. Um, this is off the record because it's not finished yet, but um, we were examining, uh, examining very closely the, the actions of uh, land and housing markets. What were the binding constraints on, on them which caused slums to come about? Who was migrating to slums? Who were the, uh, you know, wh why are they growing in particular places and, and more so than there than in others? So we've, we've, we found a number of things. I mean, number one, uh, that people were migrating to opportunities by and large, but then got stuck at the bottom uh, rung of the, the housing ladder in cities. Secondly, that you, you had a number of housing market constraints, which meant that um, the formal housing market was not able to cater to slum dwellers. So, for example, on uh, minimum, uh, on things like setback requirements or on minimum lot sizes, this meant essentially that, 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 that formal housing could not cater to low-income populations. Um, thirdly, in terms of housing finance, um, the, there are a number of reasons why housing uh, financiers are not catering to low-income populations. So um, I'd say just to complement Sheila's story about the, 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 the more on the political economy side, which is probably the most important part, there are also a, a great number of technical 
um, uh, reasons for why slums come into being. And this is one of the areas where I wish that I probably paid more attention when I was in grad school um, to, to, to look at these areas. It's very seductive to, to look at the political side, um, but the, there are a great many sort of important technical competencies um, that can be used by people to, to take on the challenge of slums. The reason for raising this now is because I, th I think it sets the context very well for the urbanization knowledge platform. How does knowledge about this kind of thing get transmitted? So, um, you know, does it take a, a, a sort of evening uh, talk in, uh, in a face-to-face -face context? Or can it be done with a written report? Well, probably not. Um, when do people actually take uh, stock of, 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 of what knowledge is out there? One of the things is, that it probably has to do with actually needing knowledge at the time. Um, knowledge is probably not something that we absorb passively until we actually really need it. And this is one of the areas that the knowledge platform hopes to speak to, um, to customize knowledge to the situations that people need it in. I mean, actually, one, exa one other example to raise, um, Vietnam, we're finding, has dealt very effectively with uh, the creation of, well, avoiding the creation of slums without necessarily a, a big political engagement. In fact, CSOs in, in Vietnam, well, that, that, that's a different issue, but they're certainly not as strong as in, as in India. Um, how is it done that? Well, particularly by paying attention to housing markets, not necessarily um, demolishing slums, in fact, providing infrastructure to slums and, and nurturing that side of, of cities. Um, so just to, to conclude on the knowledge platform itself, we were looking at a, a number of different initiatives. Um, let me just get through this bit. Um, essentially, uh, four different components um, one would be a kind of online space for knowledge exchange to occur. Um, that would be predominantly using a, a kind of um, a method of, of matching people's profiles that they sign up with according to their professional interests and then providing a discussion space for these um, interactions to take place. This is not the most novel element of the platform, but we think it's going to be one wh which will emerge as being quite useful. Um, the second, uh, particularly because people can ask open questions and then um, gain from a, a variety of responses, not necessarily people who are able to travel to New York, but they, they could be you know, uh, in situ and able um, to respond without meeting face to face. Uh, the second element is knowledge exchanges. These would be much more tightly focused discussions. Eventually, they would be voted for by uh, participants according to what kind of topics they want to come up. Uh, let's say one city presents on it, it, its policy on, on coping with um, coastal uh, sea level rise. Uh, and then there are a series of peer, uh, peer group discussions on this. We're piloting this with uh, Cisco. Um, shortly over the next couple of months on using ICT in urban service delivery. <coughs> the third element is, is um, really sparking off some of these conversations with um, what, well, at, at the moment we're calling them thought leaders, which is a bit more evocative than sort of academics and, and, and elite uh, policy makers. Um, but just some examples here. Uh, the former mayor of Cape Town, Alan Berto, who is a... Um, uh, a very um, kind of um, visionary uh, specialist on land, housing, and transportation. Um, definitely Mike Cohen or, or Bob Buckley could be up there as well. Um, Ed Glazer next on the top right. Then there's the, the chief of the Rockefeller Foundation and the, the mid-left, Bimal Patel, who is the head of, um, I think it's called HTP, um, which is like a planning consultancy in Ahmedabad and has been doing great work out there. Enrique Peñalosa, former, former mayor of Bogota. Um, Trevor Phillips, who's from the Equal Opportunities Commission in, in the UK. And, um, a, a, and uh, we thought it was appropriate to put someone else who's been speaking here today on, on the bottom right. Um, and the, f the fourth component will be a data platform. Um, this is essentially something that would be an open source uh, place for cities to put uh, data and, and hopefully incentivize academics to be part of the platform from giving them access to data. So the, these are ideas, basically. Um, I mean, essentially the question is, when there, there is a lot of tacit knowledge out there, um, 
not necessarily people who are already on Twitter or, or um, you know, have, have great networks and discussion groups on LinkedIn. How do we go about harnessing that knowledge for, for people who might find it useful? And if the World Bank, well, if the World Bank plays the role of a convener um, in, in, in knowledge exchange, how can it best um, use this opportunity? I'm seeing the, the, uh, the different parts of that presentation, you, you get the sense of the, the dynamism and the pace and the space of the problem. And then you, you see that some of these tools and approaches. It would be very interesting to get some comments from, from the audience tonight and questions about what people's reactions are to these, to these different mm -hmm. things, as well as then perhaps the two of you could, could interact a little bit about and sort of pose what, how, do you, how do you see that this, these relationships. Anybody have any questions from the back? Here, in the audience, on any of these, these questions? If we have more light. Yeah, there, she's, yeah. turn the light up, Sky. <laughs> Very good. No sleeping now, yeah, great. <laughs> okay, you have a question? Yeah. Uh, I have a question uh, for Sheila Patel. Um, can you talk more about what kinds of specific um, strategies were employed in kind of getting the housing, you know, that, that goal accomplished for this, this one village in the way, like, exactly what were you dealing with? Maybe what we do is we'll collect, a, we'll see if there are a few more questions and get them all together. Other questions or comments from people? Yeah? Uh, I was wondering if, uh, she, I was wondering if she like, could speak more about the informal and formal sectors and how they, that relationship has, um, you know, both, I guess, that relationship with the two of them and how, they, how the informal has grown more in the formal sector, meaning businesses or people have been done to be informal. And I think, I think, um, uh, I think you spoke about that a little bit too, and just the economic social interaction between the two and how the slums have uh, both worked. I mean, it seems like the city and the slum have both had this relationship together mm. and how that um, maybe sustains or grows the slum and how, uh, how that's an issue in urban populations. Okay, other questions? Marga? Yeah, I would like also to ask Sheila, uh, what role, if any, uh, had the communication technology in, in the development of your work in the years? Communication. Yeah. In the, te in the technology part, yeah. Okay. Other questions? Kim? Kim Jenna? Um, my question for Ava um, regarding the global exchange space. Um, I was wondering, there's, there's a bunch of these sprouting up now mm -hmm. by various organizations within the UN who are creating these online exchange spaces. And my question is, what is being done to actually enable grassroots oh, yes. practitioners
I don't think I understood your question. You'll have to help me. I definitely working with, uh, <coughs> like if you're creating a model for people in the private and public sector to work together on social issues. Okay. Second. Great. Okay, that's our first, first round of questions. Maybe, Sheila, you want to start? Okay. I'm beginning to feel my jet lag. <laughs> Uh, uh, the first question was um, about housing and how we accessed housing. Uh, the Federation in India has helped a lot of uh, its members and other communities of the poor get secure tenure, and it's through different forms. And we have a circuitous way of getting there. It starts off by communities doing a detailed documentation about themselves. It's like doing a census of all people who face similar problems living on a particular landowner's space. And by doing that, uh, what communities do is first of all, they produce in detail documentation about the fact that they have lived on that space for two to three decades. Because it's a very convenient urban myth for everybody to state that all poor people are transient. that They just lived there for a couple of years and they're moving around so the city doesn't have to take responsibility to find them any place. The second thing that they do is that, and this is what the, Fed, the National Slum Dwellers Federation taught everybody to do, is you go and find out empty spaces in the city. And then you find out what is the, what in the development plan is that space utilized for. And you find strange aberrations. You have uh, land that is identified as being land for the dishoused or to house economically weaker sections where there are industries and there are parks and there are gardens, or they're used for other different purposes. And then the space that poor people feel is convenient for them has other use spaces. So, so one way or the other, that space is not available for them. And persistent demands for either changing the land use patterns or for ensuring that people get the right to that claim, it takes between 10 to 15 years at the moment, that's the average we have right now, for people to get alternative options. The other route through which poor people get access to housing is, has been in India especially, is when large infrastructure projects come and poor people happen to be living on the space that's required for these large projects. And then years of creating strong people's organizations put them in a very powerful position of negotiating with the government to provide alternative relocation with secure housing options for them. So those are the two ways. The third way is to, to work, I mean, which we do with our national governments and our state governments, to say that you can no longer sit with the paradigm that you can get away with slums. And the other interesting reality is that, you know, as it's the case even here, poor people are very good vote banks for politicians. And that's a good way of getting the politicians to provide secure tenure to the place where you are staying and to ensure that you don't get evicted. So those are three major ways by which people get housing. The other question was about formal and informal sector relationships. I have a very uh, funny story that I always like to recount. Because we are known to be organizations that work on the issue of slums, we often get very rich people who suddenly find a slum coming up in their locality, saying, why don't you help us get rid of this slum? And they start off by being very rude and saying, you know, 
our properties are worth a million dollars, and here are all these people inconveniently doing this and that. And we have a very standard process. We said, you have a driver? You know, in India, people have drivers, they have maids, they have cooks. Says, you have a driver? I said, yes. Where does he live? Very close to where I live. How did he get that house? I gave him money to buy a hut. And out of that process, you begin to realize that these people get to realize that for their own convenience, they lend money to their help to live close to where they live so that they can be available to them 24-7. And out of this very small anecdote, you get to realize that it, whether you live here or you live in most of our southern cities, all the services that you have in the city are produced by people who earn less than minimum wage and who live, who subsidize your comfort by living in substandard housing, earning substandard wage. In, in Mumbai today, a very large percentage of assembly work for industries is done in slums because that's the only way they can be competitive. Most of the leather jackets and the leather shoes that you buy which come from India are made in slums. And they are done very professionally. And some amazing machines are there in these very humble homes to produce all this stuff because that's a way of reducing the costs at which products can be produced. So what you have is a situation of a very symbiotic relationship between the informal and the formal sector, but which is constantly rattled when the formal real estate uh, institutions seek to capitalize the land on which slums are. And then that sort of creates the ructions. And so every, every few years, you will have that process. And that, that's a wake up call for slum dwellers to understand that that's how they have to worry. Uh, there's a question about communication. I'm not so sure about what's the role of communication in general, but I can tell you that cell phones have transformed the lives of poor people. I remember when the first time that anybody in our organization had a cell phone was in the year 2000 when we were dealing with evictions. And one of our community leaders who was fighting these evictions along the railroads was the first person who had this. None of us had the cell phone, but he had. And today, every, every second person living in slums has a cell phone. And it's a technology that is completely transforming uh, lives of people. So is television. Uh, television has transformed the lives of urban and rural youth especially, and change their aspirations. I still don't have enough evidence of what communication technology can do for the work that we do yet. Uh, but I think in general, uh, I would say that uh, Young people, both those living in slums and those living in elite homes, have become global citizens. And in India, this is amazingly so. I think there's no other country in the world that has so much international news as we get in India. Because there are about 100 news channels. 28 of them are in English, but they're in all the regional languages. And about 30% of the news that they have is international. I don't know if that answers your question, but. Well, actually, I think I asked you before the simultaneous presentation of this urban knowledge platform, and related also to the 
how the questions that came afterwards, how the communities can benefit from mm. themselves from this platform. I, I yeah. Try and making a triangle. Okay. So, uh, uh, in what sense this can benefit uh, the, the communities itself? Uh, because it, it is a great kind of goal for the kind of making a horizontal cut and benefiting people that have to do this. I think there is still a long time to come before slums and informal settlements can have the same kind of internet access. And, uh, and sometimes uh, this is a fallacy that uh, everybody everywhere has internet access all the time. And I, I think, and I think there are two parts to this which we discussed in the afternoon in another session. One is that just an overload of information is not enough. Uh, and sometimes there's a, there's a problem in that. Uh, and, and so I think we all have to understand this technology and its power and look at how we can harness it in the use uh, of our agendas more carefully than we do today. Because sometimes, uh, we can be over-encompassing and saying this will do everything for everybody all the time, and it doesn't do that. And, and the other thing which I have observed is that just having lots of information doesn't necessarily turn it into knowledge on which you can take action. And so I think it's useful to figure that out. And the, the other question I have was about uh, women. Uh, to a very large extent, we have been uh, successful in bringing women very centrally into the process of development, but it doesn't mean that it happens without a struggle. Uh, and we have begun to understand the, uh, the different milestones in those transitions and the way in which it affects women's personal life and their public life. We also know that uh, it's very hard for external development agencies to deal with women's collectives. Development likes singular male leaders. And that's a reality <coughs> that uh, is often dysfunctional in a lot of development processes. But I think that uh, increasingly social movements have begun to acknowledge how powerful roles women play and to uh, develop processes related to that. But it's not, it's not something that happens easily. It's something that has to have sustained investment all the time. But when poor women play critical leadership roles, they are very important as role models. And that's a very important function. Uh, I'm, you were talking about uh, so, so social and Exactly. So knowledge platform, I was just curious because there was a statement made about uh, trying to connect um, finance agencies with um, developers and working together to solve the issue of slum. So I, I started to think about um, hybrid, uh, hybrid value chain models, where organizations are working together for a good, for a social cause. And I started to think about, well, would this knowledge platform help identify HBCs, bring them together, and work with local um, grassroots organizations, like for instance in India, on tackling this. There hasn't been much evidence of this working in the habitat sector. Uh, it works better in uh, other sectors and it works. And you know, it's also important that when you look at poverty and uh, impover, you know, if you look at poverty groups, up, there's a tendency to bung everybody together. And you'll find that there are segments and the hybrid value chain works with the top 20% very well. There's very little use for the the rest of them. And so there's also a big 
crisis in development where suddenly there's so much excitement about all these social entrepreneurs and making everything profitable. And what you realize is that the, the, the top 10 or 15% of the poor just need a little bit of, of these kind of options to, to, to get benefits and to uh, use these things to pull them up. And it's very easy to make this a proxy to deal with poverty as a whole. Sorry, Abha. Sorry. So can my part, uh, I'd go to, there's one question on how do you bring grassroots organizations into this space, specifically given um, the limits of technology. So I think th this is a question which has come up again and again, and actually from grassroots organizations to ourselves saying, um, you know, everything seems to be all sort of internet based and so on. And mm. so are you not excluding those groups which do not have access to the internet, and, and that basically means um, community-based organizations and, and grassroots organizations. But I think on our side, we, we want to be very, very clear that um, it's not all web-based, because at the end of the day, you know, if all interaction and all knowledge was web-based, we would not need to live in cities and, you know, <laughs> no innovation would take place. I mean, we live in compact <coughs> areas because we still, we may be on our, we may be texting and calling and, and be on the internet, but still all the innovation and, and new ideas happen because of one-on-one -on -one interaction. So how do we bring that kind of, or simulate that kind of interaction on a, knowledge, on a global knowledge platform? Because the basic idea is that, that the knowledge platform will be seeded in, in regional groups, in, in groups in specific um, countries. So it's not without face-to-face -face interaction. Because I think, and, and that is really the spirit and the core of this. But at the end of the day, globally, we would connect more through technology and, and more virtually. But we definitely will have a regional, national strands. And we plan to, to seed um, regional and, um, and national platforms through this. Um, the other thing which brings us to that is, you know, I mean, there, there are a thousand platforms going on. So what is different about this? Um, and that's it's a very, very challenging question because we feel, you know, could we have this as, you know, the mother of all networks, the mother of all platforms where we actually invite all platforms to come in? And, and you know, what does make something successful or, or unsuccessful? So we are still, you know, exploring that area. And, and we hope that we'd be able to bring, you know, um, actors, policy makers, thought leaders together on concrete issues so that we can we can take that forward. But you know the 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 platform was only started a month ago and we are rolling it out over the next six to seven months by having um, regional dialogues, three to four dialogues in each of the when I say regions I'm using a little bit of World Bank keys here. For us regions are you know Latin America, Caribbean, Africa South Asia, East Asia, Eastern Europe and Central Asia, and Middle East and North Africa. And we want to actually take, um, actually collaborate around issues which are specific to a group of countries or regions. So when we talk about Latin America, two things which stand out while we've been talking to cities and, and thought leaders and think tanks is, um, you know, Latin America, they really want to know about metropolitan governance. Um, how do we actually have regional development? Because um, that is missing. So how do we go into regional planning, regional um, governance? Um, the other one is very much on sustainability. They, are, they want to look at green cities. They want to look at green growth. So you know, these areas will emerge. In South <coughs> Asia, one of the key areas is around land and affordable housing and incremental and rental housing for the poor. So you know, we're not going to be sort of painting everything on the same brush. And as long as we can, we can focus on interest areas, we hope that we would be able to bring a nice coalition um, along, along these areas. Um, I don't know, we are probably being very ambitious, but we definitely want to give it a shot. Um, the other question was how, you know, uh, how do you bring in informality into formality? Or you know, maybe I missed the broad question. But I wanted to, uh, and Sheila addressed that really, really nicely. I just wanted to add to that in terms of 
what is the cost of informality? Because I mean, at the end of the day, if you look at uh, uh, you know economic activity specifically in Africa and Asia, you find that um, a lot of it in an urban space happens um, in the in the informal sector, and um, the cost of informal informality then is that there are no safety nets for the poor. There is. Um, nothing, you know, there, there are no minimum wages being applied. There is no um, industrial or other hazardous safety. There is no, um, um, there, there is no continuity of housing. There's a threat of eviction. So, and and when you look at the mayors, they say, well, you know, they don't want to bring services to informal, um, either informal um, um, settlements or to informal workers because they say we do not have a tax base here. So. Why should we give services? So we do need to look at, you know, how do we bring this informality and formality together? And I mean, at the end of the day, if you look at what happened in Tunisia, it was um, an unemployed youth, and all he wanted to do was sell fruits, be a fruit vendor on a street, and a policeman stopped him saying, where was his license, and upset his cart. So, you know, I mean, this really tells you about how informality and formality works. Um, and um, I also actually wanted to bring a little bit about um, one, the other area that we are, we're working on, which I think we didn't mention before, is really this, the, the huge um, demographic dividends. So, you know, one of the challenges in urban right now is um, there are burgeoning youth populations in, in, in some countries. So Middle East, North Africa is one. I think South Asia has a demographic dividend. Mm. Uh, but when you have unemployment, which goes from anywhere from 15 to 20 to 25 percent, and you have fragile institutions, how do you deal with that? And this is very much an urban, urban uh, it's a problem of an urban space. And I think, um, you know, we all talk about Tahrir today, and we talk about, uh, you know, uh, the power of, of urban um, agglomerations, of, of actually coalitions coming together and voices joining together. And if we, if we look at, you know, Spain or England, they have, Spain has an unemployment rate of 40%. The 40% of Spanish youth is resting at home. But they have safety nets. You know, there are institutions where, you know, you, you do draw a check <coughs> and you're not on the street. Um, and yet, you know, if you look at South Asia and you look at, um, especially Middle East, North Africa, the, the institutions are very fragile. So, you know, what kind of um, powder keg are we sitting on? And if this is not addressed, in an urban space, if it's, this is not an urban issue, then then what kind of issue is this? So I'm just going to end there. Thanks very much. Um, I want to raise a couple of couple of questions, which come come out of from the from the university side. One of the things that in this university we have a a very active design school, Parsons School of Design, with architecture and people working on technologies and in the arts and different fields, and we have very strong uh, programs in social sciences and interested in policy. There's a conversation that started a couple of years ago here uh, around the <coughs> relationship between design and social sciences, and it's being reformulated now in terms of design and development. That is, what are some of the ways in which we can understand design processes actually having an impact on development? Design in a broad sense, design in relationship to the design of policies. Are policies supposed to have short or long or medium <coughs> term, or what are some of their, their, their consequences, or designs in space, or designs in time? What you, you, would, what you put up here, and, and the, the platform is a design about knowledge and information sharing. But all of those things, um, it seems to me, are are explicit choices, which can be, in the jargon, pro-poor or not pro-poor, exclusionary or not exclusionary. And it seems to me that it would be interesting to kind of reflect a little bit on that. I, I, I think when, it, when I started working in the bank, uh, most of the people working on urban things were architects. Okay? There were lots of MIT-trained architects and Berkeley-trained architects. and then. Then they were kind of pushed out, right? They were kind of pushed out by, by the economists and by the engineers because the economists could talk about the policy, whereas the architects could talk about the built environment. 
So then we had all economists. Eh, economists aren't so bad, but you know they don't have all the answers, and there are lots of other kinds of issues that, that come into effect here. And so it seems to me that one of the really interesting questions now is, is how do all of these perspectives actually complement each other to give you something new and fresh that allows you to kind of advance? And uh, I'd just be interested in sort of either, both of you sort of commenting on first about, about the question of design. Does that show up in the way you, the way you think? And, and how important is it? I mean, what is it? Is this, is this something that, uh, that is relevant in this world of pressing urbanization and, you know, and search for policies? It's just a, a question. I don't know. You ask tough questions. <laughs> I mean, on, on, on a slightly lighter note, I wanted to say that um, uh, we are actually in touch with the person school for them to help us design our website. Oh. You know? <laughs> so <laughs> that yeah. itself is, is a way, you know, how design can be attractive sure. and how design can be, can be inclusive. Mm -hmm. um, and in terms of, I mean, you know, I... I look at design as um, not only something which is, you know, we should have have a functionality and, and, a, and a utilitarian kind of view, but, but also um, aesthetics, right? So, I mean, I, w I would put the question back to you, Mike, in terms of how do you think design <laughs> along with aesthetics and functionality and utility can play a role in in bridging the divide in a, in a city. I mean, I, I'd love to hear from you on this. I remember working in southern India and being told by my director in the bank at the time that design was too expensive for the poor. I remember that, being told flatly design was too expensive for the poor. But then going back to look at housing in Madras a couple of years later, and all these houses were painted, and there was design all over the place. And I said, well, how could these people who were desperately poor have design and aesthetics? And certainly, I'm sure Sheila's had similar experiences. Well, the economists were wrong. It wasn't too expensive for the poor. It was another value. It was another, it was another logic, right, which contributed something else, which we could never really understand right in our world of rationality. And so, I mean, part of the question <coughs> is here, is we, we have these logics which explain all this stuff. And the question is whether the logics are going to liberate us to think about new things and new ways of doing things or whether the logics are going to hold us in. And that's, I don't know. I don't have the answer to that. Maybe, Bob, do you have the <laughs> you know? I don't know. Sheila, I don't know. Uh, some years ago, the the person who heads the Parsons schools was in Bombay. I don't remember his name. Tim Marshall. Yeah, yeah. and uh, I, I used to think that, uh, that when you talk of design, it's about clothes and things. And that's my imagery of what it was, and he transformed my way of looking at it. Uh, and I think a lot of it is to do with uh, how liberating or non-liberating the interpretation and definition is by those who propose things. Uh, I don't see too much evidence of <coughs> the liberal interpretation of design in poor people's lives as it should be, as his interpretation is. And, and I think that then I think that uh, that uh, colleges like that have to have to actually work with people like us to help us understand that there is potential for synergy there. Because, like you say, uh, everything that's uh, it's almost like saying that you know it's like you're saying design is too expensive for the poor. That your 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 colleague's interpretation is often the way in which poor people's lives are looked at, you know? And 
I think that uh, part of uh, our collective uh, quest has to be to liberate ourselves from those kinds of oppressive behaviors. You know, that this can't do for this and that one can't do this. And <coughs> so we're in a room that's talking about <coughs> liberating from oppressions. Right. <laughs> so, but, but I think it's, uh, I think that's the other thing. So if those of us who work in social movements, uh, we owe it to um, developing relationships with everybody else to help understand who we are, what we can do, and the power of this process and how it can touch other people's lives. And I think the same goes for economists and designers and knowledge producers and stuff like that. Actually, I just wanted to add to that, Mike, you know, um, how important a role design plays in terms of um, bringing down crime and violence in, in poor communities. That's, that's what we've seen in Latin America where most of our uh, work on crime and violence is based, is how do you actually, from the design of, um, of houses, um, just in terms of, you know, are your stairwells actually designed in a way that they are open to public viewing? How are your bus stops designed? Do your uh, public spaces have um, bushes or trees? The difference is that if you have bushes, you're actually allowing for more muggings and so on, and trees are better. Um, it's just very interesting how design makes a difference in, in in, in crime and violence in, in sort of um, spaces like that. So it's, you know, just sort of many fangled um, applications. And just a small example, Michael, the pavement dwellers in Bombay actually consciously decided that they would have common toilets because they didn't want the middle class to buy up their houses. So it was a yeah. conscious input in their design. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. And, and the other issue is, is that uh, you were very clear saying uh, at the end of the day, everything is happening in one place, in a city, mm. place, in a neighborhood. And in, any, in every one of these decisions, there is a decision of design, conscious or unconscious, <laughs> uh, without a goal <coughs> or without a goal. Yeah. And then it has a direct impact in the way of, in the way of uh, the living of but absolutely direct. Mm. And then if we can find this, converging paths, not only in the results, but in the conceptualization, mm. yeah. then perhaps we can liberate ourselves of these heavy categories that they are shaping our life also, because they are shaping our thoughts. In one of the conversations that we had on this subject <coughs> here in this university, uh, it was suggested that perhaps design had replaced policy. That policy policy as intention and as definition by, by institutions was going to be replaced by something that was more participatory, that was more material, that was more processual, that in fact design could reframe things in ways in which we get different kind of results. And clearly, you use the Tunisia example, you know, or you think of of Facebook, I mean that, that someone actually thought about getting everybody in a network mm -hmm. so that when the moment came to push the button to get people to know to come for a demonstration, there were 50,000 people already there. That's designed, yeah. Yeah. right? Yeah. It's, not, it's not design how we design a bottle. It's, mm -hmm. it's, it's social design as well. Yeah. Yeah. I was just going to also offer that um, design Design gives the urban poor, I think, a language by which to frame their own aspirations and their own. Like, I mean, if you think about like Jugada urbanism, where like they take half of a truck and half of a motorbike and create a vehicle that helps them to get their fish from the village to the to the city. Um, it's it's that type of innovation that should not be ignored. I mean, the urban poor all over the world are, are accessing this kind of conception of design and imagination and innovation. And it shouldn't always be sort of this like um, academic or, yeah, you know, just like the, the elite that just map our conceptions onto the urban or without, by, you know, and completely ignoring their own, their own innovative strategies. Yeah. 
transforms the whole concept of design that actually disempowers the architect and you want the architect to then just put into blueprint what the women want and to get to that level of interaction and that level of evolution is a challenge but I think that's what we want to get to. Great. Yeah. Okay, I think maybe I'll we'll have just one more question. Anna Maria, you have a last question? Hello, this is very nice to see you both here. I actually have a question on the uh, the question is just pop up. You have spoken about the relationship between municipality and urban planning as a vulnerable point. And I was wondering how do the systems of cities and the knowledge platform uh, aim to tackle this uh, vulnerable relationship? Um, and the comment is just to see that. Um, I had the chance of seeing the latest uh, Swiss documentary on the Rabi uh, within the Jugar urbanism exhibition, and of, of course you will be there. Um, so it was impressive to see what kind of challenge the Rabi faces right now, and what kind of, of work uh, is expected uh, of you. But the most important thing that I would like to take from your speech is actually the way you started your organization and the fact that you really addressed, you, you knew how to spot um, a, a, a problem and also a solution, and not just follow a trend, that there was something that had to be resolved in a certain way, but you were there and you started the trend, so thank you. You want to? Sure. I'll, I'll just address that right now, um, um, quickly. Just the, the concept of system of cities really came by in terms of, you know, um, if you're looking at, um, if you're looking at the way urbanization is taking place, either in a region or at a national level, that instead of looking at cities on their own and how they're growing, if you actually looked at cities as, as a portfolio of places, and um, which cities are growing rapidly and why, what kind of, um, um, what sort of, uh, skills are they attracting, what sort of, what, what is their economic base, and how are they in fact um, planning in absorbing the incoming population and how they're connecting with other cities, and then what cities are actually declining uh, and why. So the idea was not to look at um, cities as discrete entities, but really as sort of uh, a portfolio which is being driven by economic, social, and, and political policies. And in that, um, urban planning and governance becomes, becomes key because you know, it's only when you understand what direction the city is going to move into that you can actually plan either for, um, for expansion or which areas are actually emptying out and how do you redevelop them or how do you repopulate them. Um, and governance, of course, plays a huge part because how do you actually involve, um, uh, how do you give voice to your citizens and, and how are you accountable back to them? Um, it's, it's sort of much neater to wrap it up like this, but you know, you know in reality it works at, in a very different and very granular way. Um, but that was a simple way of putting it into a framework of portfolio of places and, and, um, and what, um, and, and how, what um, role governance and, and planning plays in, in that. I don't know if I've answered your question or not. But. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. It's a huge debate. Though. Right. Okay. Sheila, you have uh, any last words here? Well, I don't attribute what's happened in the Haravi to me. Actually, it's the power of the local communities to resist that process that has produced that amazing ability to not allow the international real estate to capitalize on their land. <coughs> Our role has been to play the bridge between their aspirations and their hostility to that process and share it with 
the formal world. I don't know whether you've seen the latest uh, doc. Uh, we've produced a document called uh, Re Dharavi. Have, you have any extra copies that you can? Oh, I'll I'll send it to you. I send you a copy. Uh, in which we've tried to, you know, it's, it's again a very interesting interpretation of looking at design and actually using how poor communities perceive themselves, how they, you know, so, so what the government or the real estate person sees as a sea of huts are actually clear-cut communities with clear identities, with their amenities and services and what we've done is to get them to work with architects and designers and map that whole thing in a way. Like Celine says, where the professionals are in a way documenters of that reality as interpreted and understood by communities. And then creating a, a platform uh, that produces how people want the planning process to occur. It's a very interesting bottom-up approach of how change can come into that process. I hope you get to see it. Well, thank you very much. Thank you both. It's been a very interesting, uh, interesting evening and conversation. And I'd like to thank the audience for your questions. And we hope to see you back here sometime soon. So welcome. Thanks very much. Thank you.